Hey, there we are. Well, good morning, beloved. Thank you for joining us this morning, Sunday Fellowship. Uh, it's a little cool here in Texas this morning. Not too bad. It's supposed to get down to 29 degrees today. That's uh, Fahrenheit. That's not Celsius, which is um, pretty cool. Uh, it's supposed, uh, uh, supposed to warm up in the mid-40s today, so it's not too bad. But uh, we want to thank you guys for joining us this morning in Sunday Fellowship. We are going to address an issue uh, th- this morning. We've had a couple of emails in the last several weeks, and I think I might have said that last week when we finished, what we're going to talk about. If not, you got the email we sent out, and uh, if you would like to get on our email list, Jim's going to put the, the email address up at the, at, the end of the, at the end of the fellowship, at the end of the broadcast, so you'll be able to copy that down, the email uh, address and the website, or you can also... Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can become a YouTube subscriber. Uh, we'd love to have you. I'm, I don't push that a- at all. I mean, I trust the Father to draw and send whoever he wants because uh, this is for everybody, but it's to the ones who have ears to hear. So I don't struggle with who he sends and draws. I'm not I'm past that time in my walk with the Father. Is, uh, to, to, to minister the message of uh, Christ to uh to those who have ears to hear so i remember more than once when you get in religion man preachers love to have want everybody in the fellowship to 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 uh go out and invite people to come to church you ever done that you've been part of that? I, I, I was a part of that deal at one time Co- come on out get get people to come T- talk to your neighbors and invite them to church i don't want to do that that's what, what the spirit told me he said what if they don't make it to church what if you invite them and they don't make it they need to hear the gospel when when you talk to them and if you if they hear the gospel when you talk to them, they have an opportunity to receive Christ. So between Monday and Sunday, if some of them something happens, you got a way to they got a way to enter into eternal life. So uh, I'm not too much concerned about uh, uh, inviting people, quote, to church, unquote, or even the Jonathan Fellowship. Uh, we have members of the fellowship here invite people on a Sunday uh, for Sunday fellowship, that's fine, but uh, I'm just not led to do that. The father broke me that when I first got started. Uh, he said, told me to invite everybody I saw. I did. They didn't show up. Not one of them. All these people, yeah, brother, I'll be there. I'll be there. I'll be there Sunday. Man, I'm sitting there by myself in a suit and a tie. <laughs> sitting there in a suit and a tie. And I'm sitting there, believe it or not, I was so hurt. I was so hurt that nobody showed up. I started to cry. And then I heard, that's enough. I said, well, Father, you told me. He said, yes, you, I did tell you. I'm, this, is, this, is, this is a dialogue between the Father and I. He said, yeah, I told you to invite him because I want you to get it out of your system. <laughs> I want you to get out of the idea that, you, that you're going to invite people. I want you to get that out. So I'll send and I'll draw, and that's all you got to do. So from that moment on, I stopped quote, inviting people to church. Now, I don't stop sharing Christ. I don't stop sharing their need to receive Christ. But I did stop this idea of inviting people to come to church. That's just, it, it, it's a religious thing. But anyway, this morning, uh, we, uh, I have some pages here, <coughs> some notes. And, and, and I've gone over this before. I had a couple of emails, a couple of people talk to me this a uh, few weeks ago. I got an email and uh, uh, talking to some of the brethren about desensitization to the person of Christ. And so um, I did a message on that in April, I think March or April of 2015. I hadn't done this in, since 2015. But the Father has revealed a lot since that time frame, since, since, since 2015. This is 18. We've learned, and this was the beginning of uh, 2015, was the beginning of our teaching on desensitization to the person of Christ. And so uh, uh, we've, we've learned the Spirit has given us a lot since he gave us Curtis, so that probably is enough. <laughs> I had to do that to that brother. <laughs> I had to do it to him. <laughs> he, but anyway, we've had Curtis since then, so we've had, we've had great opportunities to grow dealing with this brother. <laughs> Sorry, brother. There's no woodshed today, okay? 
I've been taken to the woodshed by the father, so I really understand what that means. You don't want to go there. But the Bible does say God, King James says, chastens and scourges. That's correct and discipline. Every son that he loveth. When he revealed that to me years ago, he said, that doesn't say you did anything wrong. It just said, because I love you, I correct and you and I discipline you. Well, that took a load off in one aspect, but another aspect said, no matter what I do, I'm still going to get this. <laughs> so I said, okay, Father, it's in love. I receive it. You take, you, if you're in your flesh, you cannot receive that. If you're in your flesh, that won't be a part of your thinking. Because everything that happens to you, you think is either Satan come and tell you something you did wrong or something you need to do right. You ever been there? You, you've been there. The minute something happens, the dog dies or the, the pot, huh? Say what? Your tires go flat. The dishwasher don't work. The, the like we happen to us, the hot water heater rust bottom and hot water heater rusted out of the thing and water came in the hot. It was ugly here. <laughs> it was ugly. I ran outside and turned the line off and water was flooding in the back. Brand new house. Water, hot water heated, rusted out. So I didn't say, oh, Lord God, why does everything happen to me? That was not my first thought. You know what my first thought was? Well, Father, Father, you said it wasn't going to happen my flood again. <laughs> You said it wasn't going to have my flood again. So I know this is temporary. And we, I mean, we just took care of it. Within, within a few days, everything was done. The people came out, the insurance company. Within a week, we had things was being repaired. So we don't live that way under the idea of doing something bad. Why? Because desensitization to the person of Christ keeps us in the flesh. But let's talk about this for a second. Let's, let's go into this. Jenny, you can go by, baby. Oh, okay. Well, good. That's good. Catherine, you want to start, babe, please? What is desensitization to the person of Christ? <laughs> Second Corinthians 11 and 3. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted, desensitized from the simplicity that is in Christ. Second Corinthians 4 and 4. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, which is the image of God, should shine unto them. The process of desensitization to the person of Christ is very powerful, subtle, and incapacitating. We are responding to its effects and have no clue that we are under power and control. I compare carbon monoxide gas poisoning as the same as the process of desensitization to the person of Christ. This gas is odorless, tasteless, and invisible. The longer you're in contact with it, the more it takes you captive. Your responses appear to be normal. You appear to be in control of your thinking and actions, but you're not. It controls you. Psychologically, no, physiologically, psychologically, and biologically. The process of desensitization has the same or parallel effect. It controls you spiritually, emotionally, and mentally. Romans 8, 12 to 13. So then, brothers and sister, sisters, we are not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Hmm. Because if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if, you, it, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will, li you will live. Okay, that's good. So, in, in our introduction, we talked here about desensitization to the person of Christ and, and uh, what, what it is, how powerful it is, what it affects. And I used, uh, when the Father first gave us this years ago, I saw carbon, carbon monoxide poison. I saw carbon monoxide gas. I did some research on carbon monoxide and found out carbon monoxide has effects on the body. It, it makes you dizzy. It makes you weak. Uh, you, can have, uh, you can lose control of your physical organs. You, I mean, there's a lot of things that go on with carbon monoxide. It, it'll kill you. Well, desensitization to the person of Christ does the same thing. <laughs> you, it can have fear. Well, what's behind desensitization is fear. And fear can have an effect upon your body physically, just like carbon monoxide can. Do you know people who can be so afraid that they wet themselves? Carbon monoxide gas has the same effect. Do you know people who uh, 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 get disoriented? Fear can disorient you. You're driving around, you, you lose 
you're so afraid of being lost or you're so afraid of making the wrong turn till you get disoriented. I've seen people do that. I'm not talking about those with dementia. I'm talking about regular people being so afraid when they're, when they're in traffic or so afraid, they just get disoriented. Carbon dioxide does the same thing. It disorientates you. So there's a parallel between here, and that's what the Father gave us to use. So I've been using that. Uh, so <clears throat> what is desensitization to the first person of Christ? Well, first of all, we're going to have to define desensitization. So if you will, dear, would you please read that and let me look at that. Desensitization, the act or process of desensitizing, the reduction or elimination of a psychological oversensitivity to an external stimulus hmm. by controlled repeated exposure to the stimulus. The process of reducing sensitivity to render insensitive or it's less desensitized now. Oh, desensitize, yes. Mm -hmm. To render insensitive or less sensitive. Little or no meaning, value, awareness. To make an individual non reactive or insensitive to an antigen. To make emotionally insensitive or unresponsive as by long exposure or repeated exposure shocks. Now, let me, let me throw, say something about this, this last one on desensitized on number three that Catherine reading. To make emotionally insensitive or unresponsive as long, uh, by long exposures of repeated uh, shock. Have you heard the term when people say, uh, I, I've seen more females say this than males, although some males would, might, might say this, but I've heard the term being numb. You ever heard the term being numb? They just emotionally or psychologically numb and you can be in a relationship with somebody and that relationship causes you to become numb or because uh, causes them to be numb in that relationship there's no physical response there's no emotional response they're just numb they exist so when you're numb you're brought into a state of existence you get up you walk you talk but you are not connected you you are not connected to anyone why? Because you've been desensitized to the feelings that would get, which, which should be generated in the relationship and you are not responsive because of whatever repeated shock that they have, whether it's emotional shock, physical, whatever causes it, you become emotionally numb. You become detached. You follow me? So desen to be desensitized is in a, in, a, in a sense to become detached or non-responsive because of overstimulation. Now, and, that, and that can work what we would call, and I don't use the term very often, what can be called in a, what is called a positive sense. You know what I mean by that? You can become desensitized to think there is nothing else happening but this. The way we do it. You sensitize to the way we do it. Religion has that. You know that. All you good Baptists out there, all you good Baptists, you know that. Y'all don't speak in no tongues. Why? Because you've been sensitized to the idea that that's not of God. You've been, you've been desensitized to that. You don't, you, that. That's not of God. See, Curtis didn't come up in the Baptist. He came up in, 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 in the Bible church. Was it the Bible church? And, and I think you guys went to a Bible church. But it was more Baptist Bible church than it was charismatic. Oh, it wasn't? Oh, okay. Well, see, that, 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 that's another story. Right. Because you got two people, two fellowships that call Bible churches, and somebody's not reading their Bible right. <laughs> somebody's not reading the Bible right. Because you can't have two Bible churches. One of them say we believe in charismatic renewal, and the other say, no, -uh, that's not a God, that's not a devil. Desensitization. Okay. Uh, what I want to also, Catherine read in... <clears throat> Desensitization, the first definition she gave was the act or process of desensitization. So that tells us desensitization is a process. Now remember, there's a, there is something else. Sonship is what? A process. The process of sonship. Now you would think, which we'll get to here in a few minutes, you would think that Satan is in, uh, that, that God is, is presented to us the process of sonship to counterbalance, to counterreact to what? Desensitization to the person of Christ. It is not. It is not. God is not trying to outsmart the devil. A lot of people say that. 
Curtis told me once, he said, the devil always imitates the things of the father. He might. He might. But God is not, the father is not out there doing things. Oh, God, look and say, I, Gabriel, go down there and fix that. Get the, and tell Lucifer to come up here. I want to talk to him. We think that way. I'm, believe me, there's a lot of belief systems out there, and one of them includes God reacting to the devil. The process of sonship is not a reaction to the process of desensitization. Desensitization is a process that, that was a part of the process of sonship. We'll get there in a minute. Go on, honey. Continue to read. Satan is behind this process. What is the process and what does it look like? There are five phases or parts in the process of desensitization. The process starts with our weakness. Mm. The hook that never fails. This is also Satan's weakness, but you would never know it. He found that man was subject to him in only one way. A way that gives him power to deceive, mislead, uh, blind, beguile, and desensitize um, those who were chosen and created by God to become sons. He does all of this by the spirit of fear. The spirit of fear, 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Romans 8, 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we call, we cry, Abba, Father. Hebrews 2 and 15. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. His first recorded contact with man, he introduced the power of this weapon. His attack um, is in the heart or mind of man. We can see this clearly in Genesis 3, 1 through 7 and 10 through 13. From that moment until today, fear is his weapon of choice. Through the power of the spirit of fear, the nature of his character and person, he establishes this process. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and Genesis 3, 1 through 7 and 10 through 13 is where he beguiled Eve with. Yes, yes, yes. You shall not have death and you shall become like him or whatever. Yes, it was. Yeah. yes, yes. Everything he did. And, 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 and God knows that the day you eat of the fruit, you'll be like he is. All of that dialogue <clears throat> was ingraining fear in the flesh. Now, li listen to me very carefully. For those of you who are, uh, what do you call the women? Uh, pro, uh, anyway, I can't remember the title. Uh, Feminists? Huh? Feminists. Yes. Yes. You're not going to like this. Okay? Any feminist. If you're a feminist, I can tell right now you don't understand what it means to be in Christ. So that's okay. But for the feminists. In this dialogue, in Genesis 3, verse 1 through 7, this dialogue, <coughs> Lucifer, or the, or, the, or the serpent, is speaking to Adam's flesh. Why do I know that? How do I know that, David? How do you know that? Curtis would say. I said, well, brother, let me tell you how I know that. Because Adam said, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. He identified it not as woman. This is bone of my flesh. This is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. You should be called woman. But he said, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, giving her identity. The name woman identifies bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. So uh, Satan or the serpent is speaking to Adam's what? But. The curious thing about that is when he said, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, what was he also creating? What did he also tell us? What did he also show us, Curtis? Union. Yes. But he showed us union. This is identity. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. So he created identity between him and the body. So when, Luke, when the serpent spoke to eat, oh, I'm sorry, when the serpent spoke to the woman, you should be called woman. When the serpent spoke to the woman, he was speaking to who? Adam's or the man flesh. And he's been doing it ever since. 
But what he spoke to the flesh is what caused the problem. The flesh interpreted what was being said and became fearful. Did you know that, Jenny? Look at the dialogue. You don't have to go there now. We're not going to go there. In the past, I would have jumped on in that, but I'm, I got some stuff I need to cover today. <laughs> huh? Fear of missing out. That's correct. The fear of missing out and the fear of being. Well, that's true. The fear of missing out. In other words, God's not telling you everything. What, what, what do you mean? He knows something you don't. That's what that's what God knows something you don't. And he's not going to tell you. And he made something. For what the, what did fear produce? What does fear produce? simple in this scenario disobedience now listen the flesh <laughs> listen to me very carefully <laughs> who disobeyed who disobeyed you right you correct the man did the woman disobey no she was deceived you were always deceived in your flesh but because you're deceived doesn't necessarily mean you disobey. You have, a, you have an opportunity for the decision in that. So again, desensitization not only brings you into your flesh to deceive you, it also brings you in your flesh for you to do what? Disobey. That's one of the things that desensitization does. The power in desensitization really is to keep you in your flesh, Steve. It's to keep you in Steve. I'm going to talk about that. Not, I won't be able to get it today because I don't think we have time. But I think next week or week after, we're going to look at this word. I want, I'm going to write it on the board now so you can look at it. We're going to look at this word called <clears throat> that's, that's most of our problem. Can you see that? Whoops. Can you see that? Me. You got a problem with me. The problem is you don't know who me is. Because of desensitization to the person of Christ. You don't know who me is. You struggle with me. I don't care how long you've been in church. I don't care which one you went to. Your problem is me. What me are you talking about? I'm born again. I got Jesus in me. <laughs> That's your problem. You're still dealing with you and somebody else. Okay. Let's move on, babe. Let's go to the first, first, the first level of uh, first step or the first phase that, uh, that uh, fear brings us, or Satan brings us through the spirit of fear, is the, illu the illusion. Something that looks or seems different from what it is. Something that is false or not real, but that seems to be real or true. The state or fact of being intellectually deceived or misled. An act or statement intended to make people's, people believe something that is not true. Mm-hmm. That's John, good. Oh, go ahead. John 8, 44, ye are of your father, the devil, prone to, sla uh, prone to slander, slanderous, accusing falsely, and the less of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Mm-hmm. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, and no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Okay, let's pause. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things I want to, I did, I, I, I marked it, I underlined it in my personal notes here, not the ones you see on the screen, but I want to just refer just for a second back to, to the verses uh, Catherine used before in the spirit of fear. Paul said, you have received, the, you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. So that tells you spirit, uh, fear brings you what? Bondage. bondage. What does bondage mean? <coughs> it means, yes, it means captive, but it also means being held. No, it not say it mean that, well, I mean, it could be against your will, but it doesn't have to be against your will. You can be in bondage and not know it. People who are caught in cults. Mm -hmm. People who, who believe that because they're Baptists, they're saved. So you don't have to be against your will. A lot of times that, that might be the case. But I just wanted to emphasize the word bondage and fear is the same. 
also in, in Hebrews 2.15, uh, he said, and delivered them through the fear of death. Now, that's going to play a big, a big role as we go farther on down this morning because it's, it's the fear of death that you have trouble with this. Me. It's the fear of death. And you can talk about when Christ died, I died, all you want. But you got a fear of death because you're still struggling with some things. You struggle with me. And, and when you struggle with me, you got an issue with death. Because you got an issue with fear. I said that to a brother of, of, uh, some months ago when I was over in, in um, Ghana. We were in a discussion and he was talking about some things. And he was telling me about some things. And I said, brother, you got, you know, he's talking about uh, some things that was, he was a little bit concerned about, a little bit afraid of. I said, you don't have a problem with, with fear, brother. Minister. He said, what do you mean? I said, your problem is not fear. He said, well, what is it? I said, love. You got a love issue. If you got a fear issue, you don't have fear as your issue. Your issue is love. But we'll, hopefully we'll come to that later on today. So I just wanted to touch that. Now let's go back to when Catherine talked about the illusion. If you look in that statement of illusion, it says, it says uh, the state or fact of being intellectually deceived and misled. Intellectually deals with what, Curtis? The mind. The mind. Rhonda? The mind. The mind is the issue that causes us <coughs> to be deceived. Now look at this. Watch. The illusion. Let me give you an example. We showed that last week with a kid where the guy on the surfboard was upside down in a wave. What is that? The, the, the illusion. That means Satan tells you this is going to happen. Look at this. You... Uh, if you, whatever it is you're trying to do, he'll show you something. It doesn't come from the Father. Even if it did come from the Father, he takes it and twists it. He does not know the future. He gives you his thought about the future, and you buy into the illusion that appears before your mind, and guess what? You're in the illusion. Guess what? You're in fear. Because it brings fear. All illusions from God, all illusions from the enemy brings fear, has fear laced in with it. For instance, you got a job offer. No offense. You got a job offer. <laughs> Rhonda. <laughs> you got a job offer. And you're so excited, but you don't get a phone call. Stay comes the illusion. Maybe they don't want you. Maybe they're looking for somebody else. While <laughs> maybe, maybe they're looking for somebody else. Yeah, yeah, you, you, you had, yeah, you had them. What is that? Where does that come from? It's the illusion. And what does that affect your mind? And if you in, if you buy into the illusion and you buy into fear, where is your trust? Where is your faith? you're desensitized to the person of Christ. I wrote this little side note. I was thinking about this. The, the, when I was thinking about this. On my note here, I said, trust is the outworking of dependency. Trust is the outworking of dependency. If you got a dependency and you say, I'm trusting God, then that's the outworking of of that dependency, your trust. I'm not talking about your faith. I'm not talking about your belief. Your trust is the outworking of a dependency. But the illusion interferes with that pathway. The illusion does what? Brings you back in your flesh. What about desensitization? Me. Me! Me, Pete. <laughs> me. Desensitization. There's a reason for this me, because most of the time this me is, uh, well, I put my marker down, I don't know where I put it. <laughs> this me has to do with what? We'll get to that in a second. Let's go, honey. An illusion, no matter how persuasive, is still an illusion. Oh, I like that. 
I got that from a movie. That's not original. I didn't, I didn't come up with that. <laughs> I got that from a movie, Total Recall. They had this machine that they put you in that created these illusions. And I remember Colin Farrell in there talking to the guy that put you in this machine that, you know, gave you Total Recall. He let you have any adventure you want to have. This machine could give you any adventure you want to have. You remember the movie, right? Did you see it? You saw it. You, give you, it get, you sit there and they put this thing on your head and put some stuff in your veins and you can have any adventure you want. The problem is, it's an illusion. So Colin Farrell, when they wanted to put him in the machine, he said, he said, but, he said, but dude, you can, just, you can do anything you want. You can be anything you want. And he said, look at him with all a smile. He said, an illusion, no matter uh, how persuasive, is still an illusion. Desensitization, no matter how persuasive, is still desensitization. That's why when Satan brings these illusions, when Satan brings these thoughts that come with these pictures, some of them come with pictures. I mean, he even give you pictures with them. You see these visions. I had a vision from God. And with that vision, it's laced in fear. And you buy into the illusion and the fear seeps out into your mind. It seeps out into your heart. And no matter how persuasive it is, it's still an illusion from the devil. It's still an illusion to your flesh. It's still an illusion to your identity in the box. Okay. Go ahead, babe. The deception, the act of making someone believe something that is not true. The act of deceiving someone. Romans 7, 11. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Hmm. 1 Timothy 2, 14. And Adam was not deceived. Uh-oh. But the woman, being, uh -oh. being deceived, was in transgression. Wait a minute. Adam, what? We already said this. Adam with Curtis. You, you're not deceived, brother. Your wife is. I think that was a one-time deal. <laughs> yeah. It passed upon all women. <laughs> <laughs> okay, onward. Uh, let's see, 2 Tim, uh, Timothy 3, 13. But evil men, evil men, and seducers, <laughs> men, shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Okay, that's enough. That's enough. <laughs> what does that mean for us, de deception? That means when you bind to the illusion by fear, you automatically are deceived. That's like, do not pass go, do not collect $200. When you buy into the illusion, you are automatically deceived, Pete. You're automatically deceived, Monica. You're automatically deceived when you buy into the illusion. Because the illusion has to do with you in the flesh. Let me say it again. The illusion has to do with who you are in the flesh. It always does. That's what the purpose of the de uh, desensitization is. Okay, go down to the next one, baby. Uh, Titus? No, go to, go to captivity. Okay, the captivity. Captive, held under control of another, but having the appearance of independence. But, but that, that, I want to stop. That's why I want to skip to this one. That is so profound. That definition, that definition was profound for me when I, when I learned this last year, three years ago. Captivity, held under the control of another, but having the appearance of independence. Which means you think you're your own man. You think you're your own woman. You think you're your own whatever. But when you're in desensitization, in the illusion, in deception, you're under control of another. And no matter how much you think you, how smart you think you are, no matter how great you think you are, no matter how much time you go to church or read your Bible and say your prayers and all of those things, you're not. You're in captivity. Because you're still in your flesh. You're still in the box life identity. You're still, uh, in some cases, in union. We'll get to that in a second. Go ahead, honey. A couple of those verses. Um. 
You don't want me to finish? Especially? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Especially owned or controlled by another concern and operated for its needs rather than for an open market, a captive mind. Uh, Second Timothy 2.26, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Now, let me, let me help you with this. It says, taken, Paul said, taken captive by him by his will, correct? That means you have to buy into something that he gives you to be under the control of his will. You have to buy into the illusion and become deceived so you can become captive. Now, that's a process. It's a process. So he just doesn't take you captive at his wills at, because he wants to do it. He takes you captive. Yes, he wants to do it. But you're not captive by his will unless you buy into the illusion, Jenny. Steve. But you buy into the illusion. Once you buy into the illusion, you're on your way to captivity. Second Timothy 2.26 and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. That's I just good. read that one. You just read Romans it. Romans 7, 23. I want to skip to 2 Peter. 2 Peter two nineteen. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, the same is he brought in bondage. They promise you liberty. If you just go to our church, the Spirit of God is moving here. We have a, 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 a we have a, a, a we have a Bible believing church. I never read whether that's something that brings salvation, but that's what people say. Have you heard that? Have you heard that? Have any of you guys heard that? I, we got a we go we got a Bible believing church. Hmm. I guess what did they do before they had the Bible printed? Where did you go then? What, what did we do? Curtis, I mean, uh, Steve, what did we do? Well, I'm not going to go to you get a Bible-believing church. <laughs> Why is it that somebody here, he said, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are servants of corruption and whom a man is overcome and the same is brought into bondage. And when you say Bible believing church, keep in mind they're talking about the building they're going to. Guarantee it's the building they're going to, the group they're with. Okay. Don't, you can go down to the delusion, baby. A delusion or delusional thinking, a belief that is not true, a false idea, a persistent false psychotic belief regarding self or persons or objects outside self uh, that, that is. is maintained despite indisputable evidence to the contrary okay confirmation bias denying or compromise the truth and maintaining the lie wait a minute i want to want to test this for you for just a minute indisputable evidence to the contrary what does that mean what does that mean curtis indisputable evidence to the contrary Evidence is not disputable. Mm -hmm. It's absolute. It's absolute. Now, now, I want you to understand, it does not mean you can't hold on to that. But what it means is that you're delusional. For instance, I was talking to someone that was an atheist some time ago. And I said, everything is absolute. And they said, no, it's not. Of course, they tell you to prove that. There you go. Are you telling me I don't believe there's a God? Really? Hmm. Why? And they give you their reason. And they say, well, you can't prove to me that there is a God. And I say, you can't prove to me that, uh, you, yeah, you can't prove to me that there isn't. But I can tell you this because everything you breathe, the air you're breathing, everything in this, in the universe, everything in this dimension is absolute. So if you find something that's not absolute, you prove that there's no God. Is there anything that's not absolute here? Everything is absolute. Everything. Why? Because everything is in down motivation. Everything in this environment dies. Right now, science has already proven to us, astronomy, 
has already proven the fact that the sun is winding down. Absolute. Everything is in down motivation. Everything is heading toward an end. A death. A destruction. Irrefutable? Yes. Right now, in America, it's probably around, it's around the world, fear is, 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 I said this three, four years ago when we started talking about desensitization. What's going to happen is fear, the tide of fear is rising. It will rise to a certain point and then it'll drop off. But it won't drop off where it was when we started, but it'll drop off and then it'll rise again. That's how the end will happen for, for everybody on the planet. Not for the believer. If you're looking at the way fear ha is rising across the world and you're looking at that as your barometer, you, all, you don't understand what it means to be a new creation. We're not, we're, not, we're not what? We're not looking for signs, are we? What are we looking for? We're listening. We're not lookers. <laughs> we're listening for the sound. That's our, that's our only thing. There's no sign. We are listening for the sound. So I can't look at Curtis. I can't look at Steve. I can't look at Rhonda and say, well, because this, this, this is happening, that puts me where? I'm still looking at the flesh, trying to determine something that God says we couldn't determine to begin with <laughs> because it's spiritual. The rapture is spiritual, not fleshly. The return of Jesus to the planet Earth is physical, but not for us. Anyway, let's move on. I want to get, get going here, honey. Let's skip on down to these things to the person of Christ in place. Is in place to reveal the sons of God's true spiritual identity and oneness with their father the process of sonship will cast out or swallow up desensitization to the person of christ and yield its fruit of the son in you as you why is that why will why will it swallow up because the process of sonship is absolute and anything that is absolute swallows up Anything that is not <laughs> absolute. Go ahead. The purpose of desensitization. What is the purpose of desensitization? The what is it? The purpose of desensitization, the person of Christ, is to keep the believer seeing, hearing, and learning Christ and me. No, or no. Christ plus me. Or Jesus plus me or me plus God. All of these are union ideas and statements. They desensitize us and produce double-mindedness. Really? Curtis? Did you hear that, bro? Now, let me, let me, let me ask something before Catherine reads this verse. I've been, in, I've, been in, I've been in churches for years. Some of you have for years. How many times have you heard preach? Maybe some of you have taught this. Maybe you've, maybe you've spoken these words. Well, it's not Christ plus anything. It's just Jesus. Not Jesus plus works. We said that. Do you remember saying that? Jesus plus work. It's not Jesus plus works. It's not Jesus plus going to church. It's not Jesus plus singing in the choir. It's not Jesus plus any. We've had that. Have you heard that? It's not Jesus plus anything. It's, it's Christ alone. But when we talk about me plus Jesus, me plus Christ, we have trouble with that. It's still union. Jesus plus works jesus plus going to church that's still with that union in that a union thing that's two jesus plus prayer and fasting jesus plus believing you're good your, your, your baptism water baptism jesus plus bless me oh plus me and and whatever you're right jesus plus me and whatever i do any of that is still a, a union statement so when we come along, the Father takes us on this wave of revelation that's moving us from, G from Christ plus me or Jesus plus me into oneness. We have trouble with that. Pete, you got trouble with that, brother? We got trouble with that. Sound like to me, it's like, sound like to me, Curtis, it's del delusional thinking. But I'm not calling any names. Keep on going, honey. Romans 8, 6, 6 and 7. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. 
The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. The mind <laughs> governed by the flesh is death. Okay, if you're a believer, Paul is writing to a believer, what does he mean death? He's talking about what, what kind of death he's referring to here? Spiritual death. Well, it can't be spiritual death because if you're born again, if you got Christ in you and you're born again, you can't die. So what, it, what death is that? Anybody know what death that is? Ron, you know what death that is? Hmm? Is it the emptiness? Jen, what, what, Jenny? You didn't say Jesus, did you? Well, no, but the flesh. Oh, the flesh? Mm -hmm. Okay, she's, she's on something, but she got it flipped. Curtis, death to what? Death to who you are spiritually. That is what I said. Death to who you are spiritually. You, you can't die spiritually, but what dies is your identity as the son. Because you're still stuck with, remember when you got me and Jesus, you still got two of you, so there's a you, there's a me to deal with. When you come into the son, there's no me other than the son to deal with. That's just it's me and the father. The father and I are one. So with me being the son, there's no death in, involved in that. There's, that. Well, yeah, you die. You die to who you are in the flesh now. <laughs> But that's coming. Keep reading, babe. James 1, 7 through 8, that that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Wait a minute. Don't you use that kind of language in here. <laughs> don't, don't you use that kind of language. Did you hear what this woman said? Did you hear what this sister said? Unstable. First of all, she said that the pastor said, that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. So Paul tells us, he said, if you walk in the flesh, you're subject to death. That means you're dying, you're dead to who you are spiritually. But yet you know you're saved. I mean, you say I'm born again. Most don't say that. We say we're Christians. I'm, I'm going to do a message on that soon. I, I see it's coming. We call it, we say, well, I'm a Christian. Well, here, right now, you're stuck. Because the minute you say me and Jesus, even if you say Christ in me, you are double-minded. You got the mind of Christ and the mind of the flesh. And the mind of the flesh does not produce anything from God. You can't get it. A double-minded person is unstable in all they do. What do you mean? You mean when I'm praying? Yes. What about when I go to church? Yes. Well, I take Jesus with me. Jesus, take the wheel. If the son's not driving, who is? Me! Me! Where is he? Well, he's in me. Well, when, who's driving? Well, he is. And where are you? Well, I'm here too. See? Unstable. We call that schizophrenia. Multi-personality. Keep going, babe. This can also be called union-minded. This makes oneness and spiritual identity almost impossible to comprehend. Even, Re even revelation is something many believers uh, come from the outside in. Satan knows that desensitization to the person of Christ is critical to keep every believer knowing and learning their true identity in and as the Son of God. As I've said before, he uses fear as a spiritual carbon monoxide to poison the human soul and mind. It is by the spirit of fear that the process of desensitization to the person of Christ is so effective. That, that, that's this good. I want you to skip down to the next paragraph. Uh, no, to the next topic. What's the purpose of the process of sonship? What's the purpose of the process of sonship? 
Please keep in your minds that it is not God's purpose to stop Satan's plans. Did, did you catch that? Did anybody, did you catch that? Monica, did you catch that, Steve? Uh, Steve, did you catch that, Pete, Rhonda? God does not have a plan on stopping Satan like that. He's okay. Let me see. Uh, Satan is doing this, so I need to have a plan. No. Keep reading, sweetie. It is Satan's purpose to stop God's purpose, intent, and plan for humankind. It's Satan's plan to stop us. Can't stop God. He knows that. But his purpose intended to stop you, Rhonda. Stop you, Jenny. Stop you, Curtis. Stop you, Jim. His purpose, intent, and plan is to stop everyone in humankind from receiving Christ and living the Son. Did you hear me? Living the Son. I didn't say living Christ. Living the Son. Go ahead. Uh, that's a lot of verses here. How about just looking at the f uh, first couple of verses here? First Timothy 2.26. And that they... Oh, we already did that one. Okay. Skip down to uh, Hebrews 2.14. Hebrews 2.14. For as much taken... As the children are partakers of flesh and blood. He also himself likewise took part of the same. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. That I tell you. That I tell you Jesus took on a body like you and I. And in that body it was put to death and so are we. With that came the power that we have over death because we died at the cross. Okay. Let's, 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 let's move on. The process of sonship is to reveal and teach us who we are as the son, our oneness with the father. John 17, 21 through 22, that they all may be one as thou father art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. That now, now, for those of you who might not grab what Jesus is saying, yeah, that's good, Jim. Those of you might, he said, Father, that thou art in me and I in thee. How many is that? One. That's not two. That's not even union. If it was union, he'd say, Father, that thou art in me, and he'd go on. Like we say, Christ in me. But he said, I, not only am I in you, you're in me, and we are one. Keep going. Um, that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them that they may be one, even as we are one. Paul says, and gives us the God idea for the purpose and process of sonship. Ephesians four thirteen: till we all come in the unity, of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of God unto a perfect man under the measure of, of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, I'm going to take, a, I'm gonna take a, a couple of minutes with this verse because I want to say something about this verse. I've been reading this verse for years. But we are in a move of God right now. We're in a move of the Spirit that takes, me to, takes my understanding of this verse just a little bit further than, than, than I have read this. I've taught from this verse many times in the past, practically all around the world. But I'm seeing things in this verse now that I could not see in the past. And I, I, I'm not complaining about that. Not at all. I think it's great. I love the idea that the Father has seen fit to show me more than what he showed me yesterday. That the revelations of yesterday were not bad. They were good yesterday, but they were yesterday. So what is he saying today? Same verse. Same verse. I broke it down this way. I, I took it, and what, the way he gave it to me, I rearranged the words in this verse. It says, till we all come. Who's we? Till we all come where? You see that on the, there you go. Till we all come where? We, that means we are on the, we are going someplace. Right? It means there's an action going on. We are moving. We're not standing still. The revelation of Christ that God gave me in 1983 was good. But I'm still feeding on something because it's an ongoing revelation or understanding of what that knowledge was. Remember, spiritual revelation is not spiritual understanding. Do you get that, Rhonda? 
Revelation knowledge, Jenny, is not spiritual understanding. Kurt, right? So we all come. Where? Where are we coming to? Here. First, the fullness of Christ. What is that? What is the fullness of Christ? That means there's something in Christ that is complete and overflowing. There's something in Christ that provides something that fulfills us, that completes us. Till we all come to the fullness of Christ. Now, if you read the verse, these words are not in order. As a matter of fact, I probably could have changed this a little better, but I'm going to go with that as I wrote it down. To the fullness of Christ, what does that mean? To the, stat, to the measure of the stature. That means there is an increasing and moving image, stature, image, appearance. Now, you can say, well, for instance, my stature is six foot five. Curse's stature is three foot one. <laughs> yeah, he's a he's a hobbit. <laughs> you guys would probably hear that. But that that's the stature. That is the that is the the height, the 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 uh the width and the breadth, right? Not the depth. Not yet, anyway. That's coming. That's Curtis taught us a few weeks ago. Did you not teach us that? There's a fourth. Right now, this is saying the measure of the stature. In other words, all of the height, the width, and the breadth. That's our stature. And what is that? Unto a perfect or mature or complete man. That's the depth. Our depth is to be complete. Our depth is to be perfect or mature. So we all coming to be mature. Mature how? What do you mean mature? Mature in the knowledge of the Son of God. That's you and I. Because he said we were coming to the knowledge of the Son of God. He didn't say we were coming to the knowledge of Jesus. He didn't say we were coming to the knowledge of Christ. He said to the Son of God. Because that's our measure. That's our stature. That is the perfect or complete person that we are as the Son of God. And, we, and, and I probably could have moved that word, the knowledge of into the into the stature and the uh, into the measure and the stature uh, as well to the knowledge of the measure of the stature of what a mature a complete and perfect man what is that man what is that man Curtis who is that man don't look at me like that <laughs> who is that man Catherine the who is that man Rhonda son. thank you the Son of God. Pete, who is that man? The Son of God. We are actually, this verse is actually till we come to the Son of God. Till we come to the Son of God. All that stuff in between that is bringing us to the Son of God is who we are. You know how I know is who we are? Read verse 14. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. That we henceforth be no more immature. That's Paul in, in Galatians chapter 4, verse 1. An heir, as long as he's a child, differ nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. That's what verse 13 is telling us. We come somewhere. We, we are coming to the knowledge of the Son of God as us. How do I know that? Verse 14, that we henceforth, when we come to know who we are as the Son of God, we are no more children tossed to and fro. We're not going back and forth in our spirit of the mind and spirit of the flesh. 
We're fixed now. I'm the son of God. If I fall out of my face and cuss you out, I'm still the son of God. I run around, get out there in the street, run buck naked, and they pick me up. I get high on weed. That won't change who I am. See, we, we have trouble with that because of me. We got trouble with that kind of stuff. We got trouble with that kind of behavior. Are you telling me? Are you saying that you can do anything you want to do? Heck, I can do anything I want to do before I was a believer. Because God gave me the right to make decisions apart from him. So when he, made, when he birthed me to be his son, I can make decisions of love because I cannot make a decision of love before that time. We do not grasp that because we're desensitized to the person of Christ who is the son of God. And that person of Christ put in us spiritually makes us the son of God to the father. But it has you have trouble with that to you. You got trouble with that to you. Because you see you still. There's two people. Still. Revelation of Christ and everything. You still run around here struggling, trying to wrap your mind around me. Trying to make right decisions. How about just relax and make decisions of love? You say, well, what if I don't, brother? You don't know what I struggle and go through. Are you saved? Yes, I am. Does Christ live in you? Yes, he does. How do you know that? The spirit bears witness with my spirit. Good. Then relax. Let the process of sonship work. <laughs> because as Hebrew said, the father corrects and disciplines all the sons that he loves. So if you get all the answers right in your mind, you're still going to get disciplined and corrected. <laughs> we got trouble with this idea. Because we've been desensitized to it. We don't want, we don't, we, we've been told in religion so much. Well, you're Christian now, you just can't do everything you want to do. That's a lie. That was a lie when they said it. Can a non believer do anything he wants to do? Why can't we as believers do anything we want to do? Because God has not touched our soul, mind for the process of decision because the process of sonship requires us to make decisions based on who we are to our father. So Satan is desensitizing us to the person of Christ and the father is sensitizing us to the son. The father is desensitizing you to the son of God. Satan desensitizing you to the person of Christ, but the Father is sensitizing you to the Son, drawing you by every decision. Most of you listening to me every day, I guarantee 90% of the decisions you make are fear-based decisions. Guarantee it. Because you don't know any better. You're still struggling with, don't you struggle with me? You're making, you making fear-based decisions. I don't care how much you pray and fast. There's nothing wrong with praying and fasting. You'll escape that fire of one of them decisions. But I can tell you, you're not going to escape the fire because they're necessary. So make a decision to love and go on. What if, what, what, if, what if that's not of God? Well, you learn. You learn. You should. If you don't, you'll be on the beltway. <laughs> you know the loop that goes around the city? Yeah. You miss your exit? <laughs> you miss that exit? You blocked in it, Satan, the <laughs> desensitization blocks your lane, <laughs> you'll come back around to it. But there come a time when you say, Father, I trust you, even on the beltway around this thing again, if I got to go around again, if this is what it takes for me to see the sun as me, if this is what it takes, uh, then I trust you. I don't understand what it means to have faith. I don't understand what the, I, I know what I believe, but I'm, I'm, not even, I'm not even resting in any of that. My dependency is in my father. 
So if I got to take another loop around the beltway, I and my father won. <laughs> okay, I think that's enough. I've had too much fun already. I want to thank you guys for joining us. If you, if you need the notes, shoot me an email. I'll be glad to get them to you. Thank you guys for joining us this morning Sunday Fellowship. I'm, uh, the Father's been dealing with me in the last several months, but it's really hit a, a fever pitch uh, intensity in the last several, couple of weeks. I have to thank my dear brother Pete. been talking with him almost every evening on the way home from work. He used me as his, his, as his go-home ride, ride along with him at home on, on the way home from work. But I've been talking about some things about being born again. Uh, Jesus didn't really say born again. The translator said that. The, the same Greek word is born from above and begotten. It's the same Greek word, same Greek word. But we've got some things that parallel biological birth. And Nicodemus' comment to Jesus, when a man is old, can he go back into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered him. That's some that's some that's some that's a wealth in that. That's some that's some understanding in that that we have not seen because we've listened to religion for a long time and we have been desensitized. We're in a new day. <coughs> so those who have ears to hear, let them hear what the spirit is saying. And so with that, <coughs> hopefully we'll be able to talk to you guys about it in a few weeks. I don't know how long it's going to take for him to clear up in my mind. The mind of his son is me. <coughs> what he wants us to say about this. But I can tell you, it's almost like Curtis said to us a few months ago. He said, when, God, when the father told me I am, I said, but I can't say this. I can't say this. Now, I didn't, I didn't go that far. But uh, I said, well, father, I trust you. I, I, I want to be able to, because there's a, that's a few sticking points in my mind. Pete have heard me say that, a few sticking points in my mind. I can see it, but I can't grasp it. I can't and I'm not going to say wrap my mind around it because I'm not trying to wrap my mind around it at all. But I'm excited about this. It's going to be, it's going to be, out, you talking about out on the pier? Get your, sun, get, your, get your sunglasses, your umbrella, and your suntan oil. We're going out on the pier. So this is, this is not like, in, and, it's so, and it's the ironic thing is, we, we're going to say, why didn't we see this before? It wasn't time. It wasn't the Father's time. Anyway, thank you guys. We trust the Father to see you guys next week in Sunday Fellowship. Have a good week and stay warm. <laughs>